welcome to the first ever edition of the IJA Two Count, uh, the official podcast of the International Jugglers Association. I am Richard Kohut, and uh, with me for this month's podcast is the uh, juggling teacher, Kim uh, Laird. Is that how you pronounce it? La- Laird. That's it. Yep, Laird. Kim Laird. Laird. There you go. Okay, I, I didn't actually ask that beforehand. I probably should have, but I got it right, so it doesn't really matter. Great. <laughs> Uh, so I am uh, a little bit flabbergasted as to this. Uh, I announced this a couple of weeks ago on JOJ, but the IJ approached me recently and uh, asked me to do a podcast for the new e-zine, and so here I am, and here you are listening to it. Uh, and of course, Kim Laird is a prominent member and volunteer at the IJ, which is going to be uh, one of the basic elements, that's the word I was looking for, the elements of the two count is it's going to be myself hosting and uh, co-hosting each and every week. It's going to be a different IJ, either a prominent member or a volunteer, and uh, of course, on the podcast, we're going to talk about IJ-related topics, uh, such as the regular show that I do, JOJ. This one also is going to be formatted very similarly with uh, set... with set topics that happen each month, Uh, the IJA Center News, there's uh, This Month in Juggling History, our Juggler of the Month, the E-Zine Article of the Month, and our Trick Tutorial of the Month, and then we have Twitter and email questions right at the end. So that, um, and they're they're pretty much all self-explanatory. We have, like I say, This Month in Juggling History, we take an event or something that happened in the history of the juggling community, or specifically in the history of the IJA, if there is something like that, uh, that happened this month in the past, and we highlight it. And then, of course, Juggler of the Month, you can pretty much figure that one out. Uh, article of the Month is, again, we pull an article from the easing and we read it on air and give our thoughts. And then, of course, the Twitter and email questions at the end is going to be... Uh, Twitter questions that are asked uh, on Twitter with the hashtag two count podcast. Uh, you could just ask that, and any whoever's on the uh, two count show would basically respond to it during the next episode. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, for this month, of course, there won't be any questions because this is the first month, so it'll just be a reminder at the end. But next month, hopefully, we'll have a couple. So, with that said, uh, Kim, did you want to give a little speech about yourself? Tell everyone who you are and how you're associated um, with the IJ? Sure, I'll introduce myself. Um, again, my name is Kim Laird. Uh, I am the current chair of the board of directors for the IJA. This is actually my seventh year on the board of directors and my third year serving as chair. Uh, joined the IJA in 1999 and only really started juggling a few years before that. Um, so I, I'm relatively, I started juggling relatively uh, late in my life. Um, I also served as the 2010 Fest Director for Sparks Nevada for the IJA. Um, and I've served a, a various roles within the organization since 1999. Um, I have written for Juggle Magazine and most recently write a column called Teacher's Manual, uh, which focuses on how teachers can use juggling within regular classrooms, Um, not just the gym class, but how can you put it into the English classroom, into the math classroom, Um, and that has been met with um, a very positive reaction. Uh, So I'm hoping to continue that on our e-zine as well. Um, in my normal life, in my paid life, I am an eighth grade English teacher uh, and also a drama director. So, a drama director. That's Whoa. that's me. That's that's an odd one. I, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, the yeah, English well, teacher, I could kind of tell, but how do you? What's the drama director part like? Um, I've been doing directing kids in theater since 1985. Um, ran a nonprofit group for kids ages 4 through 18, 100% volunteer. We never got a grant 
We completely ran on what we made from our performances. Um, parents were not involved. They were told to just come and enjoy the shows. It was totally kid run. And, uh, we, I ran that, um, that group called Rainbows and Theater Company from 1992 until just three years ago with my significant other, Rob Borowski. And, um, we traveled all throughout Pennsylvania and basically the New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania area with the kids, um, performing on the road and performing stage shows. So, yep. And I'm still doing that now, though, but I'm in a high school setting. So I'm working with high school kids on a vaudeville troupe and stage productions and things like that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I wasn't expecting that at all. When I heard it, I'm like, wow. So I'm learning every day. Well, I'll, I'll give, give you another weird part of myself. I'm also a musician, um, church musician, church organist, have written music, um, mostly in the in the religious vein, but um, yep, I do all of that. Teach voice lessons, you name it. I've probably dabbled with it. <laughs> okay then, <laughs> jack of all trades here. I like that. <laughs> I've I've considered myself the same way. I mean, I've had so many part time jobs over my over you know the past eight years of working so far, and I've done like every form of juggling I can possibly think of. I mean, who knows where I'm going to go next because I'm only 24, so who knows what I'm going to do in a couple of years. Um, oh, geez, I've, I've been teaching longer than you've been alive. That scares yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> this is my 28th year of teaching, so. <laughs> well, there you, go. there you go then. Just two more years until another whole round number. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it when people have long careers and such. I think that's dying nowadays, and it's kind of not going to exist for that much longer, I think. So right. enjoy, enjoy it while it lasts. Exactly. I just like to say I juggle more than my juggling equipment. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's Kim for you. Uh, this month on the show, let me uh, just get into our topics real quick. Uh, we're going to have in our... Uh, IJ News, we've got, of course, the obvious, the launching of the e-zine and the podcast now. Um, along with that, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming festival and the uh, 2011 DVD. Um, th for this month in juggling history, we're going to do, uh, in January in 2000, the New York Times published an article about uh, women jugglers versus male jugglers, uh, specifically focusing on... Um, Ms. Sar Sarigina, that's her last name, uh, Natalia Sarigina, who is, uh, a woman juggler in Boston. They interviewed her, and we're going to go through that. And our, uh, juggler of the month, we are talking about Laura Green, uh, and of course, Kim suggested that, and thank you for that, because, uh, that way, you know, you will have a lot to talk about with that. And I'll do a lot of listening. <laughs> uh, in our article of the month, we've got uh, probably the, mo the most interesting article I found on the e-zine when it launched was uh, Living with Jugglers and an Aerial Perspective. That's the, <laughs> that's the thing, um, which is a great article, uh, f which is, you know, something that uh, you don't often see as a juggler is an outside perspective of the juggling community. So I found this article really great to see and just to get a new, you know, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So we're going to read through the article on the air and uh, then we're going to do our trick tutorial for this month, which is about eight object flashes. Uh, because that's probably what I think the the uh, best thing to do for a, an audio tutorial is, uh, you know, we can give about something that's a little bit basic but uh, is really tough and there's a lot of subtle elements that a lot of people seem to miss and you know uh, I learned just one tip that I learned increased my ability to do, to do eight ring flashes from once every 20 tries to once every other try so there's a lot of different tips for eight object flashes that'll just help you so much but uh, for right now though we're going to start with the news so <laughs> let's start in with that um, 
the launching of the e-zine and the podcast. It's been about, um, how long has it been since the e-zine launched? About uh, two, two weeks. Two weeks now, yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah. Um, 17 days since the first articles were posted, which is about two weeks, pushing three. Um, and it has taken off very, very nicely. I will, I like saying that. Uh, the, they're still, you know, working out a couple kinks and, uh, they haven't come up with a really good design yet for the website, but the big bottom line is that it's online, articles are being posted to it regularly, and they're very, very good, and especially as an alternative to the old print magazine. What do you think about this? Um, and did you have any, uh, involvement with the magazine, with the easing yourself? Yes, um, I'm actually uh, working as um, as a proofreader for the magazine. I do have some articles I'm working on at this time, um, and of course, I was involved in the vote to bring the easing in. Um, and I have to admit, I, I'm excited about the easing. Um, but as an English teacher, I'm also very married to the written type print word. Um, so it, it was a very difficult decision when we had to vote on, you know, print mag or saying or going easy. Um, so I'm happy with what I'm seeing. Um, we do have some improvements to make on it yet. Uh, the articles I feel that are coming in are much more unique than what we were seeing in Juggle Magazine. Um, and I think it's a way for us to kind of reach out to more people. Since we're able to, with the e we're able to publish some articles publicly and others are members, members only. only. Mm -hmm. So it does allow us more of an outreach in that way. Definitely does, and in a lot of other ways as well. I'd like to think. Um, I mean, going back to the argument between having continuing the print magazine versus having the easing, there are a lot of good reasons why I think the uh, switch is a really good idea. The first of which is uh, I heard a rumor. I I'm not on the IJ board, so I don't have the numbers, but that it was uh, costing a a large percentage of the IJ's money to maintain the print magazine. And uh, so once you made the switch over, the IJ now has much more money to spend on either festivals or programs or, you know, it's freed up a lot more of the funds that the IJ has. Um, that's a rumor. Am I, is that? Right. Uh, it, it, uh, that's very accurate. Yeah. Um, the Juggle magazine was costing us uh, 58500 per year. Um, wow. yeah, it, it was huge. It was very huge. And it was our number one expense outside of the festival. Um, in fact, as far as when I did the Sparks Festival, uh, two years ago, the magazine actually cost more than that festival did. Um, so yes, it was huge. Uh, by going to the easing, we have saved approximately fifty thousand dollars per year. I mean, that's going to change, um, yeah. but it, still, it, it, it's a big, big savings that we need it to do. And the board realizes that our fiduciary responsibility was to make sure that the finances were in line, and this is what we needed to do to make sure the finances are in line. Also, helps us to jump into the twenty-first century and into the electronic age a little more. That it certainly does, and and of course I I like the uh, the decisions in that you know you said the words yourself, uh, keeping the financial system in line because after you know it it is a little bit back in the past now but with Dave Davis and uh, everyone on Rec Dot Juggling basically put, ranting up a storm about how the IJ is financially corrupt or financially not spending its money wisely. To make a move like this, I think it proves them completely wrong. At least, you know, if there was a problem, you're on the way to fixing it, which is great. Right. Um, 
Another thing I love about the e-zine uh, over a print magazine is that now there's no real limit. It, it's the same sort of th- reason I like podcasting over a regular television show is because you'll th- take an example. Uh, JOJ versus any standard news uh, television program that has a guest on it. That guest has to fit within an allotted time limit. So they can only make a certain number of points. They can only talk for a certain amount of time, and they have to schedule it all out down to the second. Here, we can just have a conversation, and no matter where it goes, how interesting or boring it is, we don't plan it out that much. And it makes things much more free-flowing. I love podcasting over this. And the same thing here with the easing is now you don't have to worry about page numbers. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about... Okay, well, we have this much chunk for the main article. Then, oh, you've got to shorten this by three paragraphs if you want to make it into the into juggle. And now that you don't need to do any of that sort of cutting or push an article to the side because it's not good enough. Here, it's completely free. And, I mean, like I said, there's already such a continuation of articles on here that you've pretty much already got one full mm-hmm. magazine – uh, worth of articles, and it's been two weeks. So- right, and, and the other part, um, the part that I'm starting to like is that the articles, as soon as they're ready, and as soon as they've been proofread by two people, two of the proofreaders, they're able to be read right away. Um, you don't have to wait for that edition to come in your mailbox. So that I like, the immediacy of it. I like. I definitely enjoy that too. It also keeps things current, you know, because by the time the the magazine would have come out, an article that was written in say January for the spring issue could have been out of date by then. Exactly. But now, it's right on time, very current, mm-hmm. and I think the zine is a great idea. It can only go up. Um, in fact, I'm in the middle of actually writing an article or two myself that I'm thinking about submitting. Um, so we'll see what happens with it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, also what has been launched recently is, of course, this, the very (laughs) thing that we're in the process of creating as we're talking about it, which is the, uh, (laughs) IJA two count podcast. Um, just a little bit of background as to how this started. It was actually not my idea at all in any way, shape or form. All of a sudden, I got um, an email in my inbox from uh, Scott Selzner, yep. bas- basically saying, uh, hey, how's it going? Uh, I was wondering if you would be interested in doing a podcast for the new e that is coming up. And f- from that, I-, I was just blown away a bit because I'm like, wow, I do... I must be getting better as a podcaster because I can remember when JOJ was just complete complete I don't you know you know what I'm going to say yeah it was just not worth anybody's time at all and now I'm getting offers to do podcasts which is great um so we went back and forth on it and we've set this up and uh it's it's a little bit tough I will admit to come up with something uh that is you know it the theme is IJ you know, it's like the theme of Jugglers on Juggling. I I wanted it to be a show that was about the current state of, of the juggling community. Mm-hmm. You know, what is popular right now? And the only thing that doesn't fit with that is the classic video of the week. And the reason I included the classic video of the week is because there is such a huge amount of them that have been posted all throughout, you know, not just the course of, uh, like, the, the span of YouTube has been along, but people have been making... VHSs for ages. I mean, I just traded in a uh, juggling DVD I had for a copy of uh, Juggling Master and Juggling Master 2 by Jason Garfield, which I'm in the process of watching. Um, Not as we speak, but I just got them in yesterday, so I've been watching them. And and even before then, people were producing VHSs and getting on television as well. So there is such a huge history of, of juggling videos that I'd like to highlight some of them. Um, on the other hand, the IJ2 count is going to be more about history in general. Um, 
granted, yes, there are going to be a lot of things that are about the current state of the juggling community, such as uh, the juggler of the month, which is going to highlight either a current or a past juggler, uh, the article of the month, which is going to be from the e-zine, but everything else, um, save for, of course, the trick tutorial, is this month in juggling history is pretty much going to cover whatever we can think of in the past of juggling. Because um, there is... The, the IJ has been around for a long, long time. There is a lot of history here. And uh, it'd be a shame to just ignore that in favor of the present. Right. That... And it's, of course, one of the things that I think has been missing in my experience of the juggling world is I, I will admit I'm no historian. I The only person that I really know the history of uh, in terms of jugglers is Jason Garfield. Other, other than that, there's really nobody who has been juggling for more than seven or eight years who I know the full history of. Right, right. So, that That is the problem, if I can interject here, that... You know, and a lot of the younger jugglers don't know the history. They know the current, and I'm glad you're doing the history part of it. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. And, uh, of course, it, it will be a learning experience for me, I will admit. Uh, during the Juggler of the Month and this month in juggling history, I am going to remain pretty much silent, uh, <laughs> as my plan is, and have the IA members talk more about what their histories have been and, you know, their experiences with either the person or the uh, events in history, and we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, so that's basically the idea of this podcast is it's about it's about the IJA, but more specifically than that, it's about the history of juggling and the IJA as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this is it's going to be released uh, once a month in the middle of the month. Uh, pretty much on a schedule of whenever it's din- finished, um, a.k.a. Valve time for all you video gamers out there. Um, <laughs> um, this this week we are going a little bit... Uh, this week, sorry. This month's episode is a little bit later than nor- it would normally be. I would normally release it um, around the third week of the month, or second or th- the end of the second, beginning of the third, which is right in the middle. Um, and yeah, it's going to be once a month for as long as we can run it. And, uh, once again, it's going to feature myself and an IJA, uh, volunteer or prominent member. That's the basic gist of it. So you're up to speed. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and now I'll toss it over to Kim and she'll talk about the upcoming IJA festival and the 2011 DVD. Okay, let me start with the 2011 Fest DVD. Um, We are late, late, late getting this out, and I want to apologize for anybody who's out there waiting for it. Um, We are hoping that we'll have a release date on it of February 1st. Um, It is finished. Ivan Pacell did the editing on it. Um, Taylor Glenn and Jake Ho uh, and... um, uh, Henry and his last name's for escaping me right now, so I apologize for that. Um, but they did an awesome job, the three of them, with, uh, filming of the festival in Rochester, Minnesota. And Ivan did a phenomenal job editing. Um, and there are some things on this DVD that you just don't want to miss. Uh, the Kendama open footage is just I was talking with Matt Hall last night and told him it, it, that footage was just sick. It was off the hook. It was wonderful. Um, so the Fest DVD is late coming out, though, because what we're looking at is instead of us manufacturing a bunch of DVDs and having it sit in someone's home serving as the store, we instead are looking at a company that does on-demand printing of the DVD. They take care of the um, shipping and all, and it's actually at a vi- much lower rate than what we've been paying for replicating and holding on to the DVDs ourselves. So we had to do some research into that. Kevin Axtell has been very helpful with hooking us up with a company. Um, Taylor Glenn, who is our uh, video coordinator for the IJA, is looking into 
the download possibility, um, actually being able to purchase your video online and just downloading it to your computer. Uh, not sure if that part of it is going to happen, but the on-demand replication will definitely happen and should be ready by about February 1st. That That's our target date right now. So we're just looking at a new direction, just like with the e-zine and all. We're looking at a new direction that will keep us financially responsible um, and yet give our members and even non-members who want to buy the video, um, you know, keep them in the loop and, and let them enjoy the video. That's pretty much it as far as the Fest DVD goes. Um, so I'm going to jump to the 2012 Fest for the IJA, which is going to be back in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, I realize it's our third year going back there, but Matt Hall is our director this year for the festival, and he is... As many well know, he is a ball of fire and has awesome ideas. And uh, as I said, I was just speaking with him last night about his guest lineup, um, the Cascade of Stars lineup. And I'm not going to release names quite yet. I have his list. However, we have not purchased their flight tickets yet. So until we have those tickets purchased, um, I don't want to squeak out any names there. Um, but let me put it this way. There's, there's some rockin' talent that's gonna be there. Um, we do have to get their flight settled and a few of them we have to worry about visas. So, um, once all of that is squared away, Matt will be making an announcement as to, um, the lineup for our Cascade of Stars and our special guests. When I talked to him the other night, he is also looking at a February 1st launch date for festival registration and for all that information to be out there. Um, one thing I, I can say is um, we Matt has worked very hard to, uh, trying to think of how to say this, um, he's worked very hard with all of us who are volunteers within the IJA and volunteers for the fest. And we have, many of us have, uh, given up our festival comp for this year. Um, so again, in trying to be fin financially responsible, board members, volunteers are choosing to pay our own way to the fest. Um, because we care about the IJA that much is what it comes down to. So, yeah, it's going to be volunteer, true volunteer at the fest this year, which is really exciting. Um, and I would, yeah, yeah, it, it's awesome. Um, so it's not like we're, we're skimping. It's not like we're those of us who have volunteered at the fest before and, and work even before the fest are, going to shirk our duties at all. Um, we're still busting our tails, but we're going to go there and financially support the organization as well. So um, hopefully everybody else will too. Uh, the um, Visitors Bureau in uh, Winston-Salem has already given the IJA a grant, a $5,000 grant to help with um, kind of shuttling from the airport to the hotels and for whatever else we may want to add to the fest. Um, we are still going to have the benefit show and, of course, the championships and things like that, which are, are going to be um, announced very, very soon. So any competitors out there, anyone thinking of competing for the IJA championships, uh, teams, seniors, juniors, uh, keep your eyes and ears open on the easing, on the different forums, and all of the information will be there soon. Um, we're hoping to have a ton of competitors uh, for preliminaries this year. Um, so hopefully people will submit their videos. Um, for those who don't know and, and maybe our competitors or maybe tried to compete in the past, 
Uh, we no longer do the DVD mail-in preliminary. Um, we started last year with online submissions of the preliminary competition. So um, it's much, much easier to do. It's, it's through YouTube. Um, so it should make it much easier for international performers that want to compete um, to get their DVDs to us. Um, the, uh, I just spoke with Matt last night, as I said, about particularly the planting the juggling seed show, because that's a sh the show that I direct. And, um, we're going to add a little twist to that and reach out to the community a little bit more with that. Um, cause it is a community show. It is a free show for kids and families in the community. And Winston Salem's a pretty, um, financially destitute area. Uh, a lot of poor families are there. A lot of the kids depend on free lunch throughout the summer as their main meal. Um, and we know this because we, we've witnessed it the last two times we were there. Um, so we are going to use a little bit of money this year to actually provide a small lunch, just pizza and maybe some drinks, for the kids and their families that show up for the planting the juggling seed show. So, um, That's we are good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. we, we actually had a, a group last year, a preschool group show up, not last year. I'm sorry. It was the last Winston Salem. Mm -hmm. Um, and they showed up to the show and their advisors were there and halfway through the show, they were starting to walk out and I, we stopped them and said, wait, we, you know, is there a problem? And they said, no, but these kids need to go and get lunch. They're in the free lunch program. A lot of the kids are. And we said, no, stay. We'll buy you pizza. <laughs> and they ended up staying, and we had a really, really good time with them. And the performers met with the kids afterwards and even shared some, some you know, juggling tips and food as well. Um, and it was just a really nice, relaxed way for kids from the community to meet with some of these juggling stars. Um, Wes Peden was there that year, I believe, and I know Matt Hall was there, and um, Kevin Axtell, of course, and Sky, uh, Sky King was there the one year. So it's a chance for these kids to meet with some legitimate talent. Um, so, yeah. The 2012 Fest, again, it's in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, the third week in July. And just watch watch and listen on the easing, on other forums. There's going to be tons of information out within the next couple of weeks. Um, and I promise you the headliner will not disappoint. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's about it. Sounds good. Uh <laughs> A lot of good, a lot of good points to hit on there. Uh, too much for me to remember and comment <laughs> on each one, but uh, yeah. So we and I, of course, uh, will be also, like you said, uh, following up on it and talking more on each episode about what plans are happening for people who don't care to read and would rather listen. And uh, of course, if I do show up there, it sounds like something that I might do would be uh, take part in the what's his name. Uh, the planning the juggling seed show because that sounds like a good experience. Awesome. And yeah. Uh, plus, I mean, I, I can't help but think that the message that I would send would be like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're fat and out of shape. You could be a great juggler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps me and Steve will buddy up for that routine. Uh, that'd be good. Cool. <laughs> yep. Um, so yeah. The uh, festival sounds like it's shaping up very nicely, and uh, once again, starting off in February, you can sign up and uh, learn some more information about it, which is in just a little over a week right now. Yep. So there we go. So uh, that'll be just about it for the news, I believe. So that's what's happening with the IJ recently. And um, yeah. So, let's move on then to our next topic, which is uh, this month in juggling history. Um, and of course, being a bit of a trial run episode uh, this month, it is kind of a topic that um, is a little bit older than my experience, but 
not that much older, and it is general. It is the New York Times article that was published in 2000 about a career as a woman juggler in Boston, um, which is, of course, Natalia uh, Sarigina, which is, uh, man, I that, pronunci- that pronunciation was probably wrong. I, I can, <laughs> just because of how it sounded, I can guess that that's really, really wrong. Uh, <laughs> Sarigina, or however it is. I'll call her Natalie S. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so she is a female juggler in Boston, uh, proclaiming not to be the best in the world, of course, is one of the things in the, uh, article. Um, at the time she was 100, she was 28 years old, um, and performing at, um, where was she performing? Big I, Apple Circus. The G- Big Apple Circus, that's what it was. Yep. I, the article is, like, slipping my mind now because I'm thinking about the IJ so much. <laughs> Uh, did you read the article? Yes, uh, I did. Have it in front of me. Yep. Yep, as do I. Um, my my question actually, though, is did you read it when it came out? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, uh, you mean back in 2000? Yeah. No, I, I was, like I said, I didn't even really get serious about juggling until about 1999, right around that time. And even then, I really didn't read a whole lot about juggling. I was more interested in just learning the different skills um, and not so much about the history. The history came later. So this was interesting. Okay. Um, well, the basic article is a slice of life article about what it's like for her to go through uh, at the Big Apple Circus, her experiences and uh more specifically than what her experiences are, uh, what her preferences were, and how she compared herself uh, to other jugglers, more specifically male jugglers in the field. Um, and she would say that, you know, one of the things is she is one of the best female jugglers uh, that she had ever seen. She was, uh, ooh, sorry, uh, that. She, but even then, she was not one of the best jugglers in the world by far. You know, p- that distinction was, you know, being argued amongst all these other people like Sergei Ignatov, Mike Motion, and all these other great people who were doing so much more than she was. But what she was doing was that, what her point was, is that she's okay with that. She doesn't mind. She does her own thing, and she knows what she's doing, which is basically using her femininity realizing she's a woman playing into that and using that on stage to, uh, I mean, I hate to make it uh, overly sexual, but to sex up the routine, basically, to make it uh, really sweet looking, really nice and flowing, using all of her feminine characteristics in order to build a routine around that, Um, which is a little bit classical when you think about it, Um, but it's what really, really works well. And, uh, yeah. Uh, go go right ahead. I, I was going to say that um, when I actually at first I didn't realize what year this article was from. And uh, then I looked at the date after having read it. Uh, and a lot of the things that I think she, uh, Natalia, kind of seemed to struggle with or a little bit within her time period, um, you know, with, with male type juggling versus female type juggling. Um, even though she broke into the male arena, apparently, because according to the article, she was juggling clubs that were, you know, a lot heavier than the batons or other lighter things that women were juggling at that time. Um, Uh, it's nice to see that we've made strides. And even though female jugglers are out there and more prominent anymore, um, thankfully, I, I think the females still kind of struggle about whether to, as you put it, kind of sex up the the performance and, and make it very, very feminine, or do we go all out for the, okay, I'm going to compete with the guys type of thing and what they can do, I can do. Um, mm mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the modern 
women, the present women jugglers that I have seen, um, Aaron Stevens, Jen Slaw, Cindy Marvell, Francois Rocher, Heather Marriott, just to name a few, I think they've kind of started to find a really nice balance between all of that. Um, I completely agree. I think they're more than even finding a balance between the two is they're utilizing both. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I particularly think about uh, Laura Ernst and um, what's her name? Um, I You just mentioned her name, and I completely forgot it. Uh, her trademark move is five ball overheads while she's doing a split down on the ground. Um, that is... Oh, wow. Um, it's either Heather or Aaron. I believe it's Aaron Stevens. Aaron. Yes. Okay. I believe it's her. Um, they both utilize... It's not like they're trying to uh, go between being feminine and doing great juggling tricks. Is they're doing both at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, think like I said, you're doing five ball overheads, which is you know if you would say to somebody, yeah, I can do five ball overheads. That's a great juggling trick, whether you're a guy, a girl, experienced or not. It's still difficult. And then of course a split by itself is very feminine and very difficult. So to do both at the same time, it's like you're not – you're finding a good marriage of the two, um, in, and they're, and both sides are good on their own. Um, then, of course, what Laura Ernst will do is she's getting into so many other different performance elements as well. Like she does a silk act. She does her poi act with uh, the, the floodlights. Yeah. And then she – but then she's also a really good club juggler as well. Um, granted, she doesn't do five clubs, you know, super technical moves and things like that, but her, her three club level and her trap sequences are very much on par with, I mean, they're better than I am with clubs. Uh, so, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. So you can, you can watch it and you can take it on, she could strip out all the rest of, you know, what the femininity is, all the dance moves, everything else, she could strip that out and still have a good club juggling routine. And that is one of the things I like about what women jugglers are doing now. Yeah, I I think they're... I don't know, maybe it's the sexist in me or something. Um, I I think women are really starting... And this is going to sound so sexist. I think women are just starting to find different ways to express themselves through juggling where and i'm sorry guys but where guys are more interested in the numbers and how can i muscle things up more Mm -hmm. um and and that's just what i've seen in recent years that the women are really trying to take it in a different direction and what else can we play with out there what else is there that i can manipulate um some guys are doing that too but it still seems like the juggling world expects guys to, okay, I'm just going to do um, five club back crosses all day long. Um, I yeah. don't know. Maybe that's just I used to only be able to do five up 360s. Now I'm going to try and do seven up 360s. Yeah. I think you're completely right on that. It is a lot of things that – and, I mean, I'm going to sound a little bit more sexist when I say that I think that that partially springs up out of uh, a, a woman's um, – you know, lesser technical abilities. It's like their arm strength is potentially not as high as a man's, so they can't throw a DB9 as easily. So instead of doing the incredibly difficult thing, which is even more difficult for them, they would go in a different direction and do the more creative aspects, which is just as good, if not better. True, true. And I think Natalia is one of the... um, one of the pioneers of all of this because yeah, she was doing as she kind of puts it in the article, male type juggling. Um, but she put that female spin on it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the precursor to what I was talking about. Laura Ernst and, uh, Mm -hmm. just doing is they would, they would try, they would not try to just focus on the one direction. Either I'm going to become a really good juggler or a really good performer, I'm going to meld the two. And, you know, it. I mean, when I, when I say it like that, it sounds like any juggler could do that. 
but really it's it's basically what they were, it's what they were doing and it's what made her good enough to get an article done in the New York Times. Exactly. So, yeah. Um anything else to say about that? No, I I just found the article very very interesting and uh I found it interesting because I remember going to fests in 2000 and only like three or four females being out on a festival floor. And uh, it was so male dominated at that time. Um, it's still a male dominated activity, but it's nice to see that at least we can put 30 female jugglers in a room now. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. You, you'll see them roaming the halls in packs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just nice to see the progression and to think back at in the history and look back at something like this and realize, wow, we've come a long way, baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly the point of learning your juggling history. Yeah. Uh, so if you'd like to read the article yourself, it's still available on nytimes.com. Just search for uh, the name of the article is Juggling a Career, Tossing Clubs, and Carving a Niche in Male Bastion. And uh, so there you go. You can find that. It's a good article to read, and it'll give you a little bit of perspective. So let's move on to our next topic then, uh, which is our Juggler of the Month. And uh, go ahead and take it away yeah. because you know more about this person than I do. <laughs> oh, this person was a huge inspiration to me. Uh, by, the way, by the way, we're talking about Laura Green. That's yes. who the person actually is. Yes, I, and I was going to say that, but thank you for oh, okay. Bring, that's okay. Um, Laura Green, the juggling queen, also known as Ms. Tilly. Um I heard about this woman from day one of joining the IJA, um, and she is an icon within our organization, especially for the women within the group. Um, and for several years, I I just heard about her and really, really wanted to meet her. And when I did, I was just flabbergasted. But let me give you a little bit of a background of Laura Green. Laura Green is the co-founder of the IJA Flamingo Club. The Flamingo Club is specifically for women jugglers, and we honor women in juggling, especially young women, and try to inspire them. Uh, in 1991, she was the IJA People's Choice Award at that year's festival. Uh, she was included on the DVD Trailblazers, Women Who Juggle, which is, I believe, still available in the IJA store. If not, um, people can get in touch with me or, or email me through the IJA, and um, I will find where they have copies yet. Um, I know Cindy Marvell has copies as well. Um, and in just recently, more recently, in 2009, Laura Green established the Silver Jugglers Club within the IJA, and the Silver Jugglers Award, which is to render us, the purpose of the club is to render assistance specifically to senior jugglers, preserve and present IJA history, share knowledge and skills with others, and they honor a senior juggler, usually each year, who embodies those special qualities that are the soul of juggling. Um, Laura Green, for anyone who has met her or knows her, knows that she is just a ball of fire. And she will not think twice about saying and speaking her mind. And um, she's just an inspiration. Um, a little bit more of background history. Uh, she actually was a successful art director for an insurance company in Maryland when she started out on her career. She had a, a very impressive salary, huge office, big staff, and a daily migraine headache, um, as I found in the one article on her. And then in order to kind of relieve 
the stress of her job, she kind of took up juggling. Um, from there, her joy of juggling turned into street performing, and she has performed on stages throughout the and streets throughout the United States, Canada, China, and Japan. Um, she served as art director for Juggler's World, which was the IJA publication previous to Juggle magazine. And she served as the 1989 uh, convention chairman for the IJA. Um, she studied with Reg Bacon, uh, with Bob Berkey, Fred Garver, um, Tony Schifalo, Roger French, Mark Capel, Robert Peck. She only ever formally trained in one area, and that was in clown camp at Canton, Maine, for the summer of 1980. Uh, from there, she lived everywhere from Los Angeles up to British Columbia, back down to Maryland. So she's been all over the place. Um, she performed at the Olympics in Los Angeles um, as part of the street performers that were there. Um, while there, she teamed up with Susan Kirby, another juggler, um, and went on. They then both went back to the Olympic Stadium to continue to perform, to street perform. She didn't just perform in the Republic of China, but she actually lived in China for several months teaching English and still doing her performing as well. Um, Laura is a very free spirit. Uh, and as I said, she doesn't think twice about speaking her mind. You ask her her opinion, she will tell you. You ask her for help, she will give it. Uh, she has a huge, huge heart. Um, my first ever meeting with her was at the IJA Festival in Lexington, Kentucky in 2008. And I did not know that she was going to be there. And as soon as I saw that she, that Laura Green was teaching a workshop, I had to be at that workshop, even though I was working the festival. <laughs> it was the one workshop I made sure I got to. Mm -hmm. um, I went through, it was a three ball workshop and it was on different warm up skills and that. And at the end, of the workshop, I went up and introduced myself to Ms. Tilly. And, oh, my word, um, it was an amazing meeting. I was, it was my first time as chairman of the board of the IJA that year. And, 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 um, when I introduced myself to Laura Green, I just simply said, hello, I'm Kim Laird. I'm so glad to meet you. This woman took my hand and went to her knees and started bowing before me, saying how much she appreciated everything I've done. I had no idea she even knew who I was. <laughs> um, and here this woman was, this woman who I idolized on her knees, thanking me. Um, I was beyond heaven at that point. Um, she has been a great inspiration to me on the IJA board. Um, she has helped me to write some of the uh, articles for my um, teacher's manual column. Mm -hmm. And she has also uh, just been a really good friend. And I have seen her mentor jugglers. I've seen her wacky side. Um, and this woman is just an incredible juggler and an incredible person. And if anyone ever gets the chance to meet Laura Green, the juggling queen, otherwise known as Miss Tilly, you should definitely take that experience to meet with her. She tr truly cares about the history of juggling and keeping the history alive and well, not just of IJA, but of all juggling. Um, 
She's just a quality woman. And that's what I have to say about my, my Lara Green. <laughs> that's great. Uh, yeah, you can uh, – I, I will be the first to admit right now, I do not know who that person was until you mentioned it, and I did a little bit of research. And, uh, yeah, she's done quite a lot of stuff. Uh, not necessarily, you know, first, um, you know, like got really famous or anything, but definitely, you know, she's been just about everywhere and done just about everything that I can see uh, and think of in in terms of, you know, uh, being, of just being out there and being a juggler, you know, so much stuff. Um, I've, I think I'm going to order the Trailblazers DVD now, which is, uh, by the way, she's one of the features on there, uh, which is Trailblazers, Women Who Juggle, um, so now I've got that mentioned, and the Flamingo Club, which I'd never even heard of before, yeah, that's a, that's a great club that she's, uh, basically started up, and, yeah, I'm, pretty much browsing the website right now just taking a look at it and, and, it, and it continues today yeah, yeah. okay yep. yeah it, it's the club is absolutely phenomenal um and the award that we give is given at each festival to a young juggler um anywhere from birth to age 17 usually, but we don't always stay in those guidelines. Um, and Laura is the one who started up that award. And it, it's to honor someone who shows willingness to perspire and motivate within the juggling world. There you go. That's a good set. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I can't win it anymore, but oh well. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Always good. Uh, I, yeah, it's exactly what we need, though, is more more young jugglers who are just becoming better than every other juggler on the planet. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm kind of for that. Then. <laughs> uh, back to uh, Laura, though. Um, I, again, I, I will admit I have to plead some ignorance because, you know, um, I did, I did, I've never met her. I <laughs> don't. I can't seem to find any video of her, which is the odd thing. But um, either way, there is there are a couple articles and a quick search of Google for Laura Green, the Juggling Queen, which is, by the way, I just want to say it, that is such a classy and old school and such a great uh, nickname, Laura the Ju- Laura Green, the Juggling Queen. That's great ring to it. Um, she doesn't even need the other one, which is Miss Tilly. She doesn't need that at all. Just Laura Green, the juggling queen. That's great. (laughs) Um, And she gets royalty in every way. (laughs) So, quick search of that, and uh, you'll come up with a lot of great information. Yes. Um, So, shall we uh, move on then to our uh, article of the month? Yes. Um, actually, I just got buzzed that I have a bit of an emergency at my home. <laughs> Whoop. Oh, boy. So, All right. Well, we'll take a quick break for uh, some sponsors, and uh, we'll pick this up in a little bit.
And we're back from our break. Um, bit of a longer break than actually you heard. Uh, it took a full day for us, but you just took 30 seconds off. <laughs> um, that's, that's just fine, though. Um, coming up next on the podcast now, we've got our, our e-zine article of the month, which is, I think, the best article uh, that popped up out of all the... Um, prim- What's the word? The uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not premiere articles, but well, the, all of the first issue articles. Yes, I guess. the first issue. That's a good good <laughs> saying for it. Yes, um, it's learning to live with jugglers an aerial perspective, and uh, it was posted on January third to the Easing, and um, I'm gonna read it on air. Um, so here we go. Um, like I said, posted January 3rd. It's got three comments on it so far, and it's a really good article by uh, T. Lawrence Simon. It's wintertime. My house is cold. The first snow of the season has just begun, and my calloused hands are trembling. Unaware, we had let our oil supply run out, and so now our heat is temporarily disabled. Our fireplace inset wood stove is mysteriously defective. Uh, four people have just recently moved into a house together to start a 10 month long professional circus training program. We are tired, sore, and desperate for a source of heat. Uh, we took to the left of the fireplace at the uh, slightly ornate and freestanding log holder. Upon it, no wood was placed, but instead are two dozen juggling clubs. No typical source of heat in sight. I began to consider the unthinkable, but uh, I can't. For you see, I live with jugglers, and burning them would be sacrilege. <laughs> that That's a bit of paraphrasing there for me on my part. Uh, let's step back for a second. My name is T. I am an aerial circus artist. Well, I've known how to juggle three balls and three clubs since I was a wee lad, I've never taken that skill set anywhere. I've been training aerials for almost six years now, and that is what I make my career doing. I got accepted to the New England Circus for Circus Ar- Center for Circus Arts, sorry, uh, professional track training program, along with 16 others. I met my roommate Teddy and Jeremy at the uh, live auditions, and Tom at the auditions for a different circus school the day before. Jeremy and Tom apparently knew each other quite well, and Teddy and I, both aerialists, clicked instantly. Uh, we all decided to rent a house together during our 10-month stay here in Vermont. The first week of our new living arrangement demanded the most adaptation for all of us. We had to figure out what groceries to get as a family, uh, who would put which utilities in their name, in which rooms juggling was not allowed, and... Wait, what? As if you could not juggle somewhere? Uh, Teddy and I soon learned that the mentality of a juggler is just as driving as the mentality of an aerialist. When I walk into a new space, no matter where I am, or what I'm supposed to be doing, my first thought is to look up at the ceilings and see if there are any structures off of which an aerial apparatus could be rigged. I always have my mind tuned into hanging off of things and interesting structures to play on. Equally to the juggler's mind, if he or she is holding an object, they must manipulate it. Throw it, spin it, pass it, bop it, wiggle it, and understand all of its physical movement qualities and propensities. It can be difficult sometimes, especially if the object is a jingling key ring or an apple that you were hoping to eat. (laughs) (laughs) And that is so true. (laughs) He's hit the nail right on the head with that one. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, At first, I also found it somewhat alienating when part of the conversation became bilingual. I'm talking about, of course, English and sight swap. (laughs) What? (laughs) Once the conversation drifted from nouns like mailbox and trapeze to flats with 441 or 423 with fours as lazies, threes around the neck and underarm twos, we non-jugglers began to feel somewhat left out. (laughs) I can imagine why. Oh, yeah. (laughs) In retaliation, Teddy, our resident female, and I might make some joke about how she's the first girl to be seen coming out of the shower by a juggler. (laughs) After... After some more confusing conversation and a few more juggling prejudice jokes, we all decided we would make our house a safe space for jugglers. We didn't want to live in a home torn by whether you could choose a life off the ground or one where you toss things up into the air. We wanted to care for each other and support one another 
under the re- under the metrictions of stress and physical exhaustion induced by a professional training program, which is quite a <laughs> quite a mouthful of words. That is, <laughs> um, we wanted to come home to a place where jugglers felt free to throw and aerialists felt free to hang, uh, and after that, our home life improved. As the program finally accelerated to cruising speed, we all stopped waking up every morning sore and uh, started training more and more independently after classes. Soon one of the main differences between a juggler's training and an aerialist's training brightly emerged. In aerial training, you could probably train for three to four hours in a single session. We would train, leave the studio, eat a meal, and then eventually we might have an evening class or go to a stretch. Our roommates would leave the house at 1 and not come home until 10 or 11 at night sometimes. We started getting into the philosophy of uh, being the different training methods. Uh, Obviously, both jugglers and aerialists need to do things perfectly in performance, but the method for achieving perfection are somewhat different. Jugglers will run a trick thousands of times in repetition until their success rate has increased to as close to 100% as possible. Aerialists slowly train a skill, beginning with as many safety factors in place as possible and methodically removing extraneous safety techniques, such as grabbing with both hands if a trick is done with one, until we can safely and comfortably execute the skill without any training wheel add-ons. Unlike the jugglers, for us, a drop isn't a normal part of the training process. (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) Nor do I. (laughs) Unless you have a lot of padding on the ground. Um, <laughs> even then. <laughs> even no. then, it is it would be a pain in the ass to get back up. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I began to miss the jugglers while they were away on their longest training periods, developing a growing curiosity about juggling. I started to go to the sectioned juggle jams, uh, open training just for juggling, to entertain the idea of being a better juggler. After Tony Duncan, the fantastic juggling coach at our school, lobbied for jugglers to get more than one open special training time a week, uh, they are allowed to juggle whenever they want, but dedicated space where no one near them is in the air is hard to come by. I started coming to every juggle jam. Now I get to hang out with my two awesome juggler roommates uh, a bit more. And I'm even starting to feel okay about liking to juggle. (laughs) Now I can... (laughs) Yeah, which is <laughs> which is a phrase that anybody who's taught juggling has heard a surprising number of times. Yes. <laughs> now I can pass six in a four or two count. I can pass ultimates with six, and I pass seven clubs. I can do a four-four-one inside of passing a four count. I can finally do a three-ball shower, <laughs> and I'm beginning to work on reversing it. I can throw a lefty double pirouette in a four-count pass. I can join in on different feeds and multiple person passing patterns. I can also do a beat half twist to ankles, front hip circles drop to a toe hang, a swivel hips to double S wrap into a triple shoe shoe fly. I'm also working on elbow circles transferred to back hip circles stalled to side planche. What? (laughs) (laughs) I have absolutely no idea what any of those things were. Because I think they're all aerialist moves. They are. They are. <laughs> and that's just to put into perspective what what it sounds yeah. like to other people when we go, yeah, I can do 4-4-1 four, four, in singles. Yeah. <laughs> My name is T. Lawrence Simon. I live with jugglers. I'm an aerial, cir- I'm an aerial circus artist, and I'm a juggler. <laughs> <laughs> I love that last line. I, I just love it. I love it. It's great. Because although he's an aerialist first, he's recognizing that hey, he can also be a juggler. But as you were reading this article, you know where my mind went? Where was it going? <laughs> Have they tried vertical juggling yet? Passing from an aerialist ah. to someone sitting, standing on the ground. That would be awesome. <laughs> Well, this was written on the 3rd, so I would assume by now they must have. Well, and I know Tom, um, because Tom's on the board with me, so I'll have to contact him and find out. (laughs) And we'll have an update on that next month. (laughs) I I just love the fact that this article, of all things, is not, is written by 
as he says in the last thing, an aerialist first. He is a juggler by admission, but, you know, he's he's an outsider to it as well. Mm-hmm. And so he has that kind of perspective of, you know, to, to us, to every juggler listening to this podcast, you know, just sitting there idly uh, contact juggling an apple that's from somebody's lunch bag seems perfectly normal to us. It's like, what? Oh, that? Oh, I'm just practicing, or I'm just having fun. <laughs> and the other people that's... are looking at us like, that's my apple, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and how many aerialists have ever been kicked out of a supermarket produce section, you know, where I'm sure more than a handful of jugglers have for picking up the oranges and juggling those, or the apples and juggling those, or pretty much anything we could in the produce department. <laughs> anything that's... About two and a half inches across and round, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I, lear- I learned a long time ago working at ShopRite never to visit the glassware section. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> just, just in case. I never actually broke anything, but just in case the temptation finally caught up with me, <laughs> I learned to avoid that section. Oh. Uh, Our theater kids that we taught how to juggle, um, we always warn them, do not juggle in the produce section um, when your mom's shopping because we've had kids that have been told, please put those down. You're going to damage them. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> we've all been there, but has an aerialist ever done that? Can't go and hang it upside down. So, yeah. It's- I'm not sure, but I, I wonder if any aerialist has ever gone to a ceiling fan store. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thought. <laughs> I can just see the wee as they spinning around for the fan. On this. That'd be cool. <laughs> Hopefully, an aerialist is out there listening to this and says, "Yeah, I've done it. I've done it." <laughs> and if they haven't, maybe they'll go to their you know local home improvement center and give it a shot. <laughs> that would just make my day. <laughs> Just the image of that in my head. We need a YouTube uh, video. <laughs> we, screw a YouTube video. We need an animated GIF of that that goes there, continuously. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, oh, that'd be so good. I, w- I would do it if it, if I weren't afraid of breaking the ceiling fans. <laughs> oh, I'm man. a height, so I'm out there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Let's, let's just get back to talking about the actual article instead of sure. hanging from ceiling fans and spinning around. <laughs> I, I I love the fact that this is done from an outsider's perspective. And um, he's actually a very, very good writer. As an English teacher, I love the, the, the imagery that he throws in here. And he makes it so real for the reader so that we can almost feel the cold in the house. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and some of the stresses that they went under and, um, is, I love, it's a cool collaboration of arts within one household. So. Which uh, is something that I do look forward to eventually having the experience of. I mean, when I get my first house, I know I'm not going to be able to afford it by myself. So I'm going to be living, uh, in some way with either jugglers or somebody who, you know, basically uh, shares some of my other hobbies as well. Mm-hmm. Either, you know, filmmaking or uh, geeking, like, uh, as in uh, website design or programming, things like that. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a preview, hopefully, of what my life would be like, <laughs> is getting to understand other people this way. And I, I just love that about the article is that he, this, I mean, I'm trying to figure out the words to describe this. I don't say I idolize him now, but I have a good respect for him now because a lot of people um, are, I mean, and I'm not saying circus performers are an exception to this usually, so maybe this is not a very special case, but anybody who takes the time and effort to go and, uh, you know, pursue an interest or pursue uh, learning to understand someone else, whether they live with them or not, 
is always a great thing. So somebody goes, you know what, I want to understand why this person has to contact Juggle and Apple whenever they have one, and goes and learns and find and begins to understand why. That's great to me. I love that. Yeah, and, and wouldn't the world be a better place if more people took the time to do that in, in any aspect of life? Oh, yes. So very much so. I mean, I, I don't want to get political, but that statement applies so much to, uh, you know, just people who see dichotomies in politics, you know. Mm -hmm. These, like, people who are Republicans who just hate everything Democrat mm -hmm. or or libertarians who just hate, hate anything from the two major parties, you know, right. or atheists who hate anything religious, you know, understand where it comes from. Then you can be free to hate it if you still feel that way. Um, right. But we do need to learn from one another. And that's what it seems like these four individuals did in this household. Um, they learned from each other and, and they're, they're learning each other's boundaries and not only boundaries, but they're respecting each other's space. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but they're, they're respecting with an understanding and with having learned what that space means to the other. Um, you know, the, the aerialists now understand, or at least, um, He's at making least an effort to, yeah, at least he learned Simon, understands you know went to the juggling went and did this you know tried to learn and it's like oh okay so this is why this is important to them um so yeah yeah that that shows that you really care about your roomies and um also that you have an open mind and but i think a lot of circus performers a lot of performers in general tend to have an open mind mm -hmm. i think they have to i mean it's it's part of the old thing, uh, lesson that you hear whenever you talk to a stand-up comedian. Uh, I first, and I first heard this quote in, uh, with Robin Williams when he was on, uh, what's his name? Inside the Actors Studio. Oh, you, yeah. You have to be absolutely fearless. It's like, for normal people, here's the line where they go, nah, I don't want to go there. And here I am having to go, wee, look at me, I'm running <laughs> over the thing. You know? It's like the gland is burnt out. Uh, that's kind of not just applies to comedians, but to pretty much all performers. Mm -hmm. We have to have that burned out gland that, you know, whenever people go nah, and shy away from something, we have to explore it. Right. So I think it's <laughs> it's the most perfect thing I've ever heard about performing. And to understand that and what makes it special is really appealing. Yes, I agree. Agreed. A little insight into performance art from uh, Robin Williams. Yeah. Which, if anybody hasn't doesn't watch uh, Inside the Actor's Studio, by God, download a couple episodes and watch it. Yeah, it's awesome. I, yeah, I recommend George Carlin and Robin Williams. Yes. All right. And uh, with that, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to comment on about the article? No, I, th I think I kind of said it all. All right, then. Excellent. With that, then, we're on to our trick tutorial of the month. And uh, with this segment, it is going to be a little bit uh, weird because I'm still not 100% sure whether uh, with this segment I should be uh, giving a brand new audio-only tutorial every month or a review of a tutorial that's already out there either on YouTube or someplace. And we're going to try it this way. Um, basically, giving my giving tips, um, of course, it is going to be me talking during this because uh, Kim hasn't ever flashed eight objects before. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, As I said before, I kind of, I, I do the gamut of equipment for teaching purposes and don't concentrate on numbers, so mm -hmm. my bad. <laughs> That's okay. That's just fine. I just I picked eight, an eight object flash as the tutorial because I think that is one of the things that uh, really a lot of people could use a lot of tips on, and it would also be best uh, in audio form as well. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who uh, haven't ever flashed eight objects before but are close, 
Um, you don't really need to be as close as you think in order to do flashes. The di- the the uh, difference in in difficulty between things like an eight ball flash and a six ball qualify is actually more skewed than you'd think. Yeah, I think an eight ball flash is actually about the same level of difficulty as a six ball qualify. If you can do that, you can do the other. Um, so don't feel like you have to go. Oh, I with the uh, traditional progression of qualify 6, then flash 7, then qualify 7, then flash 8. No, you can skip right to flashing 8 if you like, uh, especially because it is an even number flash. When you do it in synchronous, it becomes very easy, uh, which is the first tip that I want to do, is when you're doing an 8-ball fl- or 8-object or flash, learn it in synchronous first, because obviously it is much easier to sync up both your hands, and basically, if even if you're still having problems uh, where one hand is either weaker than the other or less coordinated than the other, uh, your brain has a much easier time mirroring your good hand uh, when it's doing the same thing at the same time. So, it, it's kind of a cheat, but, you know, when you're just trying a flash, it's all about cheating. <laughs> now, I have a question, if you don't mind, Richard. Um, sure, go ahead. Because when I first learned four, um, it was said to do it synchronous as well. And yet I could not learn it in the synchronous style. The way I picked it up quicker was async. Um, Is that just a personal preference? Is that just because it was a lower number? I think think it's... Specifically because it was four. Okay. Because, because uh, thinking about it, th- the first time you'll ever encounter a synchronous pattern mm-hmm. is with four objects. Because with all odd numbers, you either, the only uh, synchronous pattern you have are uneven ones, like one up, two up. Um, right. So you're only, ex- so you'd never had any experience with a synchronous pattern before until you learned four. Okay, makes uh, sense. That and also, of course, uh, you're talking about learning to qualify the pattern, not just a flash, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always think that it, it is far easier, no matter whether it's an even or odd number, to uh, learn an asynchronous pattern when you're going past a flash than it is to, you know, to just getting the same number of, just getting them all out there and catching them again. Okay. All right? Yeah. Um, that answers one question. Um, the next big tip, sorry, that I had uh, lined up to give is one that is the big one that I said earlier, the one that basically got me from going once every 12 tries to being successful to once every other try being successful. And that is the key to it all is the first throw. Um, what you want to do when you're making that first throw is go a bit higher than you normally would for the pattern. Um, It is, of course, you'll hear it a lot of times, and Alex has talked about this on JOJ along with a couple others. Um, It's the hardest throw of them all because it's where the objects in your hand, you have the least control over them because of the way you're holding that fourth ball or fourth ring. Uh, It's always either with, you know, your worst fingers like your ring or your pinky finger or it's being held on top of other balls um, that end you've also got to throw with the weight of all the other objects in your hand without throwing those other objects so it's basically doing a, a normal throw with weights attached to your wrists so it makes it very much harder um, so what you want to do in order to combat that is a lot of people, when they're flashing, will have their arms a bit, you know, they would be out in front of you like you normally would be doing when you're juggling. The trick is to really focus on pulling your arms in to the sides so that your elbows are basically as pinned to your uh, to the side of your chest as you, as you possibly can get them. It might not sound like it's very important, but the the thing is the biology of it is that when you pull your arms into the sides, 
all of a sudden, instead of throwing using the muscles in your shoulder, you're throwing using the muscles in your bicep. And that makes a huge change because the shoulder is not designed specifically to throw, you know, to make that kind of motion. It's designed to move in all directions, like, you know, to reach your arm back behind you or to move it around in a circle. It's not meant to act as a lever, um, even more so from the fact that your shoulder muscle is mostly placed along your back. So you can imagine how much of it, how strong it is uh, when it applies to moving your hand around. Your, your uh, bicep is much closer, and it's much more in line with your hand. You know, if you draw a line along the center of the muscle, it points to the hand. Um, so you can imagine how using the bicep is much more, uh, is much better and more efficient for getting those balls up out of your hand than it is to have your arms out in front of you. And of course, this also applies to rings as well. Um, so, and that's basically what helped me to, uh, get my flesh a lot more consistent is keeping your arms back and concentrating on that. Uh, the next thing I want to go into uh, with high flashes is the issue of bouncing, especially when you're doing synchronous. A lot of people will tell you that you should bounce, or rather not that many people will tell you that you should bounce, but a lot of people will tell you that you should not bounce at any at, at all, that you know you shouldn't use the rest of your body to throw the objects just your arms. I think it really all depends on what you want to do. If you want to just get that flash, if you think you're, you know, like right at the edge of your skill set that, you know, you'll be able to maybe do a, a couple more catches than just the flash with whatever you're trying to accomplish, then go ahead and use the bounce. Um, but if you are intending to actually continue on after that, say, you know, you learn an eight-object flash and then you want to eventually be able to qualify it, try to b keep your bouncing to as little as possible because you can bounce four times and make those four sets of throws much easier. Uh, but, of course, you can't – it's much harder to bounce eight times in a row <laughs> with with the consistency needed to qualify it which is kind of funny to talk about, but it, it, is help. it is a helpful tip, I think. I know that I definitely uh, give a bit of a jump during the first and second launches, and the uh, last two will go pretty much lightning quick out of my hands, um, partly because I, I'm rushing because I have a low pattern, but also because, you know, it, like I said, the more, the more you release, the easier and faster you can go because you have so much less weight bogging down your hands. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think about what other tips I could give for high object flashes. Uh, did you have any questions, Kim, about flashing? Not really, but what I found interesting was the whole biology of what happens when you move your arms out compared to when you keep them at your sides. Um, and, and I think that's what some people, just as a side note here, tend to forget when they're juggling is there's a whole physiology to this. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do things physiologically correct, you're going to have a much harder time with it. So you, you kind of have to keep the, the muscle and the skeleton structure in mind as you're trying to do these tricks. Absolutely. Um, I, I would disagree a little bit with the skeletal structure. I mean, because, you know, you take a look at Thomas Deeds. He's <laughs> leaning so far to the side. But, but you know, you think about the muscles particularly, because really when it comes to juggling, it is muscle control that you're after. Um, you want to take a look at how your body is designed to make a, a, a type of motion like a throw. And, mm -hmm. of course, the uh, best way to do that is to use the bicep. It's the strongest muscle in your arm. It's one of the two that is directly in line with your hand, the other one being, of course, your uh, forearm muscle. Um, but, of course, your forearm muscle is much, much weaker. Um, it is better at finesse, though, which is 
why you can use that when you're doing complicated tricks, but that's uh, getting a little bit tangential. Uh, the physiology is definitely, definitely important. And uh, if you if you do find yourself, if you're, say, on a practice session making a lot of attempts and you feel either that muscle getting tired or you feel it tough to uh, keep your arms at your side, you're starting to drift into just throwing or heaving and hoping as yeah. I call it take a break rest those rest that particular section for a while and then go back and try again and uh, that's that should be eight object flashes for you um, the only other thing I can think to talk about is placement of objects in your hands and mm-hmm. uh, this this is just a matter of preference but the main the majority of uh, what you want to find out most people have the same three ball grip. It's the uh, triangle, the one right next to the thumb, the one on the middle finger, and the one held in by your ring and pinky. Um, once you get those three solid, then you can either put one on top and hold it using another finger, and this is, again, personal preference. I like to hold it with my thumb. Or you can have it at the bottom to make a diamond shape. I personally don't like that method uh, in my left hand. I prefer it in my right hand. And this is another thing that I want to talk about is don't feel like you have to be symmetrical about it. Whenever I do my eight ball flashes, if I'm feeling uh, a bit lazy or like my left hand or right hand doesn't feel like doing a certain pattern or, sorry, the certain holding technique that day, I will do a diamond pattern in my right and the pyramid in my left. And it is, it isn't that hard to... Uh, negotiate separating the two throws. Um, like I said before, it is easy to mirror, um, but really, it's such a minor difference, and at this point, you've been juggling enough that your brain knows how to make these sort of throws. It's completely natural and second nature at this point. So you won't find that much of an issue with it. Question here. Do you happen to... Um... In your experiences with other jugglers, do you find that if they are doing higher numbers, that they're using uh, smaller size balls, or do they use the same as if they're doing three, four, or five patterns? This is another good question. Um, I've I personally use the same size balls, but the thing is, I don't like large balls in general. I usually mm-hmm. use only a two and a half inch set. Um, but I have seen a lot of people, and it's not so much about the size of the bags that are important. It's about the fill level. Uh, there's only a couple of people I can think of off the top of my head that use, you know, either full-size stage balls or Russian balls to do high number flashes. One of them is David Furman, and he has to do it because of his allergy to uh, bird seed and you know other types of fill that are used in bean bags. Uh, he can't use them without allergic reactions, so he has to use Russian balls. Uh, the other people I can think of that do that are professional performers, people like Victor Key, uh, who basically learned that way because that's what they had to do in order to perform. They can't suddenly switch balls on you mid-performance and then go for a higher number with a different set. Right. Uh, so most of the times what I've seen is people will like to use uh, bags that are bled out. Uh, and the reason for that is, number one, it's easier to hold on to because uh, instead of having to deal with uh, e- that fourth ball, especially your thumb hanging on to it by its side, you can pinch the fabric. And it, it's basically the same as like grabbing the tuft of skin on a dog. Uh, as, as, as mean as that is, it's like, it's kind of the same idea, just less yapping. (laughs) Um, so that's good. Plus also the, uh, the great thing about having bled out objects is that they do fit the lightness criteria that you want. Uh, when you're going for higher numbers, lightness is one of the important things that you'd like to have. Uh, you know, nobody does an eight ball flash with... Uh, liquid-filled stage balls, is, or, you know, <laughs> unless they're the small variety. And even then, not right. that many times. Um, so, yeah, that that's that. And, um, 
Yeah, size is a bit of a factor, but more than more than that, it's it's the weight that you want to be concerned about. Okay. So there you go. Cool. And uh, hopefully uh, that's a bit of tips for eight ball and eight object flashes for everyone. Um, yeah, we'll have another tutorial for you next month and another episode for you next month. Uh, and of course. Our final segment, which we're not having today, of course, is our Twitter and email questions, which can be asked anything in general. You know, if you've got any sort of juggling-related question that you would like to ask either the IJA, me, uh, whoever the guest host is going to be, or just anyone in general, you can ask it on Twitter with the hashtag 2 podcast, or you can email the IJ with that subject uh with that with that in the subject line and it yep. it'll come back to me so we'll have some of those for you next month hopefully and uh thank you very much for listening then i have been uh, richard cohort aka reese's 2150 here with kim laird and um thanks for listening yes. we we hope thank you've enjoyed you. it <laughs> all right Do you want to say goodbye at all? Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's perfectly all right. It's it's been a long day. Yes. <laughs>